Joining us now on the line from Washington, D.C., Colin Call. He is former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East and now Assistant Professor in the Security Studies Program at Georgetown University. And Colin, we're happy to have you on TVO. How are you tonight? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Well, let's go back here. December 15th, 2011, not that long ago, the flag of the American forces in Iraq was lowered in Baghdad, formally ending nearly nine years of U.S. military operations in Iraq. Tell us exactly, with that flag coming down, what that, in effect, means. Well, it means that, uh, that U.S. forces, which at the height of our involvement in, the, in Iraq uh, totaled some 170,000, are now no longer in Iraq. I was actually on the ground in Baghdad at the Baghdad airport uh, on December 15th for that what's called casing of the colors uh, for the standing down of U.S. forces Iraq, and it was a historic moment. It basically uh, marked the end of or at least our major involvement in the war in Iraq. You, of course, were Obama's guy there, so you didn't get us into this war, but what went through your head when that flag came down? Well, you know, what went through my head is that, uh, you know, we'd been at war uh, inside Iraq for uh, near, nearly nine years uh, at the cost of some 4,400, 4,500 uh, American dead, uh, 30,000 plus wounded, uh, you know, in excess of 100,000 Iraqis wounded, hundreds of thousands displaced. It's, it's been a long traumatic period, a lot of blood and sacrifice. Uh, it was good to see it, uh, our, our major part of it coming to an end, but also I think there's an opportunity for uh, Iraq to be a more stable place uh, moving forward and to be a, continue to be a partner with the United States. Legally speaking, with the departure of the American troops, does anything change in Iraq, legally speaking? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we, our forces were there from, from, uh, from the beginning of 2009 until uh, December 31st of last year. Our forces were there under uh, what, what was known as the U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement, and so they had a, legal, a certain legal status um, uh, that expired at the, end of, uh, at the end of December of last year. So at the moment, we have a very small number of uh, U.S. military personnel associated with an Office of Security Cooperation in our embassy, uh, which operate under diplomatic immunities and protections, but that's really the only legal standing that uh, our forces have at the moment. Okay. Uh, obviously, when you take 150,000 troops out of a country, they're not all there one day and then gone the next. There is a phased withdrawal, and I gather your strategy had two phases to it, so let's go through that. Phase one was what? Yeah, phase one basically was, well, first we need to take one quick step back, which was that the Bush administration negotiated an agreement with the Iraqis I just made reference to at the U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement, which basically established a three-year timeline for the departure of, of U.S. forces. When President Obama came into office, however, he kind of detailed the contours of what that drawdown would look like. Phase one would be a reduction from about 144,000 forces when we came into office to 50,000 uh, by the end of August of 2010. Uh, and then uh, the remaining 50,000 forces would, would redeploy over the, over the ensuing uh, uh, year and a half. Let me read something to you that was in Foreign Policy magazine back in October because, uh, of course, the, the president was willing to come to an agreement with the Iraqi government that would have allowed several thousand U.S. troops to remain in Iraq uh, in a kind of a training mission, I guess, uh, beyond uh, the end of last year. And here's what Josh Rogan wrote about it in Foreign Policy. But what about the extensive negotiations the administration has been engaged in for months regarding U.S. offers to leave thousands of uniformed soldiers in Iraq past the deadline? It has been well reported that those negotiations led by U.S. Ambassador James Jeffrey, Army General Lloyd Austin, the top U.S. commander in Iraq, and White House official Brett McGurk, had been stalled over the U.S. demand that the remaining troops receive immunity from Iraqi courts. Okay, there was no deal. Why was immunity such a sticking point? Well, uh, in, the, in the 2008 U.S.-Iraq uh, security agreement, uh, in Article 12 of that agreement, um, U.S. forces, which were operating inside Iraq, had jurisdictional protection, which, uh, which means basically that if they committed any crime, uh, they would be prosecuted under American law within the jurisdiction of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. They wouldn't be susceptible under the vast majority of cases to Iraqi law. And so as U.S. negotiators in 2011 sought to uh, 
uh, see whether there was the possibility for an agreement that would allow a small number, uh, as you mentioned, a few thousand American forces to remain beyond 2011. They were merely trying to replicate Article 12 of the uh, of the existing uh, security agreement and give uh, U.S. forces the same types of uh, jurisdictional protections they had before, and frankly, that they have in mo in the vast majority of countries around the world in which our forces operate. Now, since the U.S. troops left, there have been some frightening incidents in Iraq where dozens and dozens and dozens of people have been killed. Do you think the inability to strike an agreement between the United States and Iraq is already starting to, in some respects, come back to haunt both sides on this? No. Uh, I mean, the, the, you, you are right that al-Qaeda in Iraq has, has uh, sponsored a number of high-profile attacks uh, uh, where several dozen uh, Iraqis have been killed uh, horrifically uh, in Baghdad and elsewhere. But of course, those bombings happened when we had 150,000 forces in the country, too. So there's not a direct uh, causal relationship necessarily between uh, our presence and the bombings. I think what you're seeing is that al-Qaeda and other groups are trying to probe uh, for weaknesses uh, with our departure. But even if we had kept a, a few thousand trainers, uh, you're not talking about uh, people uh, you know, doing combat patrols in Baghdad or, or, or something like that. So it's not clear to me that the, uh, the absence of an agreement had any causal relationship to making Iraq more vulnerable to this type of violence. Understood. Okay, let's follow up on something you said a couple of minutes ago where your, your country is drawing down forces from 140, 150,000 to 50,000 and then from 50,000 to zero. Logistically speaking, how much of a challenge is it for a country to do that? Well, you know, uh, it, if, if, you, if you've never been to Iraq or if you were never in Iraq during the height of our presence there, it was just remarkable. I mean, at, at one point we had in excess of 500 bases and facilities all across that country, and we had more than 3 million pieces of equipment. Uh, so all of that stuff had to be moved out. Uh, the bases had to be closed. Uh, they had to be uh, uh, clean. They had to, the environmental standards had to be uh, regulated. A bunch of those bases had to be handed back over uh, to the uh, to the Iraqis for their use, uh, and then all that equipment had to move out. Most of it came down uh, uh, the highway system into Kuwait, but some of it went out through Jordan, and some of it even went out uh, through Turkey. So it was really one of the largest logistical uh, uh, enterprises in in U.S. military history, probably since the Second World War. Is it the kind of thing that the military wants to do? in secret or are they content to have it be done in public and people can watch? Well, I think it's a kind of a combination of both. I mean, of course, the fact that we were closing down these bases, withdrawing uh, our troops and uh, in bringing the equipment out of Iraq was not a secret. In fact, it was it was mandated under the U.S. Iraq security agreement. But of course, you want to do it in a way so that people, uh, so you don't present a lot of targets on the highways, especially uh, uh, targets for improvised explosive devices. Um, you don't, you don't want to be obvious about when you're closing bases because then uh, insurgents might launch rockets at those bases at a point where they think you're vulnerable. So it's kind of a combination of both, where there's a public dimension, people know you're doing it, uh, but you want to keep the sequence and the pattern of it uh, somewhat secret. The New York Times quoted a U.S. soldier the other day as saying, the Iraqis are going to wake up in the morning and nobody will be there. Now, when you were there in December and you saw that flag come down, were you concerned for Iraq's safety, given that a massive, I'm sure the American government would look at it this way, or much of the American government, a massive security blanket for Iraq is now no longer there? Well, Frank, you know, I, I, to be honest, uh, that security blanket has been gradually taken off uh, over the three years of, of the Obama administration. If you go back to uh, 2009, uh, we exited the Iraqi cities in the middle of that year uh, in compliance with the U.S. Iraq security agreement. So we were out completely out of the cities. We weren't patrolling in the cities. We weren't doing counterinsurgency operations in the cities. Uh, and then with the change of mission uh, in uh, the August-September time frame of 2010, we moved away from doing combat and counterinsurgency operations altogether towards this advise and assist and training uh, relationship. Uh, and we also reduced our force levels to 50,000. Um, so we've be basically been backing away, kind of taking our hands off the, uh, the bicycle, allowing the Iraqis to pedal forward. The Iraqis have really been in control of, this, of security for the vast majority of the country uh, for quite some time now. And in our assessment is, is that they're relatively capable of maintaining a level of internal uh, security uh, in the coming years. And do you have any idea what they're going to do with all of those hundreds of former U.S. military bases? Well, some of some you know, uh, you know, when I said the nexus of 500, you know, some of these were a handful of shacks. Uh, so some of them have just been dismantled. Uh, a lot of the bigger installations have been tr have been just transformed into Iraqi uh, army uh, uh, bases. Uh, and some of some of the uh, 
uh, the government buildings and palaces that we'd set up in shop have been repurposed for, uh, for other uses. So, you know, the, the Iraqi government owns these facilities and they're using them for lots of different purposes. Do you know how many Americans, and I don't mean just soldiers, but how many Americans, period, are still in Iraq today? Something in the neighborhood of 2,000 uh, associated with the U.S. Embassy, which is about the size of our larger embassies in places like China or Mexico City uh, or Cairo. Um, uh, what makes Iraq a little different is that obviously it's, it's a less safe environment and it's harder to, uh, to kind of get everything you need for life support for our, dip our diplomats off the local economy. So the unsafe environment and, and the economy aspect means you need a lot more contractors to support uh, those 2,000 folks. And, than you do in most places. And you've anticipated my next question, which is I, I've heard quite divergent uh, estimations of uh, how many contractors are still there, private contractors, not combat troops, obviously, who are protecting those 2,000. Um, what's your best guess on it? Well, it depends on what you mean by protecting. There are, there are probably about 14,000 contractors that are associated with those 2,000 diplomats and the handful of military personnel we still have in the country. Some of those folks are private security contracts or, uh, contractors providing perimeter security, movement security, et cetera. But a lot of those contractors are cooks, cleaners, uh, janitors, uh, uh, truck drivers, uh, things like that. And I should also mention that a large number of those contractors, uh, the vast majority of those contractors are not Americans, and many of them are Iraqis. Okay, so the, the stories that we would have read many years ago about this former company, you know, that's now, I'm not even sure how to pronounce her name. It's spelled X-E. Z. Former, Z. Blackwater that then turned right. into Z. Exactly. Yeah. The old Blackwater folks, they're, they're not running rampant all over the country anymore? No. <laughs> Short answer for a, for a good question. Okay. Uh, recent events of violence that we talked about just a few moments ago have led to some criticism about the United States. And this is from Iyad Lawi, the former prime minister, who said, quote, the Americans have pulled out without completing the job they should have finished. What do you say to that? Well, you know, uh, Ayad Alawi is an interesting guy. Uh, he's a very prominent Iraqi politician. Um, of course, he spent much of the last year uh, criticizing the United States uh, for wanting to stick around and, and trying to bludgeon Prime Minister Maliki for even considering a follow-on agreement with us. So he's obviously uh, changed his opinion uh, a little bit. Um, I do think the point that he made, uh, along with another a uh, number of other Iraqi politicians in that New York Times op-ed that you're uh, referring to, you know, that there's something to that, that there's still a great deal of political reconciliation and accommodation that is required for uh, Iraq to have an enduring uh, stability moving forward. And, and that's something that, the, uh, that Iraqi politicians are going to have to continue to work through. And as I said, we have a very large embassy, one of the largest embassies in the world. And a big part of their job uh, is to help uh, the Iraqis uh, reach accommodations where, where we can serve as an, in an honest broker uh, capacity. Well, here's you actually writing in Foreign Affairs in the year 2008. You wrote, now the principal impediment to long-term stability in Iraq is the reluctance of Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki's central government to engage in genuine political accommodation. Now, you wrote that three and a half years ago, and yet here we are three and a half years later still talking about the same thing. Um, if, if the U.S. has left, what is progress actually going to look like in Iraq at the end of the day? Well, no, I, I mean, I think you hit your you you uh, hit the nail on the head with that one. I mean, political accommodation, the absence of political accommodation across the board, uh, is re continues to be the single greatest challenge that Iraq has. Now, the good news is is that the vast majority of Iraqis remain committed to the political process and trying to make sure that they exercise their grievances and reach uh, and reach uh, conflict resolution peacefully through the political process. So there's a lot of fiery rhetoric, but a lot of uh, a, a lot less shooting in the streets. So that's the good news. Um, but no, it, it continues to be a challenge. And you've seen uh, in the last month or so a lot of tension between Prime Minister Maliki's state of law party and Ayat Alawi's uh, Iraqiya party, uh, terrorism charges against the Sunni vice president, uh, 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 Tariq al Hashmi, who's holed up, up in Kurdistan, uh, you know, Maliki trying to get rid of uh, Salah Mutlaq, the deputy prime minister who's associated with the Iraqiya party. So there's a lot of tension at the moment. However, uh, the Iraqis uh, have, a, have a method uh, to deal with this, and the, the major bloc leaders, I would expect, are going to come together in the near term uh, for a summit or some other uh, major meeting uh, that's basically aimed at uh, trying to figure out a, a way uh, through the current political impasse. I asked Michael O'Hanlon from Brookings uh, this question, and let me ask it to you as well. Uh, I know you guys, you're, the administration that you used to be part of, didn't get the United States into Iraq, but you have got the United States out of Iraq, and after it's all said and done, 
Was it worth it? You know, I don't know that we can say in the moment. I think it's something that historians are going to have to look at 10 or 20 years from now. And, and uh, I say that not just to jo dodge the question, but it depends on, you know, worth it based on what? I mean, thousands of American dead, hundreds, uh, you know, in excess of 100,000 Iraqis dead, a trillion dollars uh, uh, spent. Uh, so obviously there were huge costs. Uh, but Iraq was also an enormous source of regional instability under Saddam Hussein. And his dictatorship also produced hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dead uh, uh, Iraqis. Uh, and so clearly the region is better off without Saddam. Uh, so I imagine this is going to be something that, uh, that historians and politicians argue about for a long, long time. The good news is, is that, you know, we can have all these, we can have kind of an academic debate about relitigating whether the war is worth it or not. But I do think we have an opportunity now looking forward for Iraq to be a stable, uh, a much more stable country in the region and hopefully a partner with the United States uh, and a force for moderation in the region. And in 50 years, when I have you back on this program and I ask you the same question, and Iraq is a Jeffersonian democracy, I presume at that point you'll be able to say, yes, it was worth it. You know, I think we're finding in the I think we're finding through the Arab Spring that that all the countries in this part of the world are going to have to find their own path uh, towards uh, towards democracy. I don't think Iraq will ever be a De Jeffersonian democracy. It'll be its own thing, but that's okay. Uh, it can uh, it should be its own thing. Hmm. Colin Call from Georgetown University. It's a great pleasure to have you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your help on this. Sure, it's great talking to you.